November 1930. A fur trapper by the name of Joe LaBelle treks across the cold, barren landscape of northern Canada. In the distance, he can see a shimmering body of water, like a jewel nestled in a desert of ice and snow. For LaBelle, Lake Anjakuni is an oasis promising resources and company. An Inuit village resided at the banks of the river, where they, like many other Inuit communities at the time, were known to engage in a thriving fur trade with Europeans. But as he nears the village at the edge of the lake, a place which had become a familiar pit stop for him over time, he becomes aware of an eerie silence that seemed to grow ominously as he approached. The usually busy community appeared empty and abandoned. And as LaBelle began to investigate, he realized something was very wrong. You may have encountered variations of this Canadian ghost story across the internet over the years. The legend of the vanishing Inuit village has been resurfaced, debated, and retold many times. What is the origin of this legend? Is there any credibility to Joe LaBelle's bone-chilling story? Let's take a closer look at this captivating and creepy folktale. I'm Dominique DeBell. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Haunting History. Joe LaBelle's story can be traced back to a real report from 1930 by a journalist named Emmett E. Kelleher in the town of Pa. The story has since been popularized and retold in several books, first with Frank Edwards's 1959 work Stranger Than Science, and more recently with John Robert Colombo's Ghost Stories of Canada in 2000. More disturbing details of LaBelle's supposed account are revealed by Kelleher's report. Allegedly, there had been about 25 men, women, and children in the community, but there were no signs of anyone anywhere in the village. But strangely, according to LaBelle's story, there were no signs of violence. Tents were still pitched with tools and other items of value inside. LaBelle also claimed that he found unfinished shirts with the sewing needles still stuck inside, food still hanging over a fire pit, and a rusted rifle under a parka. It was as if the members of the community had left quickly, expecting to return, but vanished instead. Eventually, LaBelle reportedly encountered two emaciated but still living husky dogs before discovering the bodies of seven others that had apparently starved to death. Then, as LaBelle continued to search the camp with the two dogs following him, his story took a darker turn. He allegedly encountered a cairn that marked a gravesite which had been disturbed by something unknown. According to Kelleher's report, LaBelle noticed how the lines of stones encircling the cairn were undisturbed, and that it didn't seem as though the grave had been dug up by scavenging animals. He said that the stones had been pulled off of one side and there was nothing inside the cairn at all. I have no way of telling when it had been opened or what had been done with the body it once contained and I couldn't figure out why it had been desecrated. LaBelle allegedly went on to conclude that although there was no sign of struggle, the air seemed deadly. After catching a couple fish and feeding them to the starving dogs, he left in a hurry and reported his findings to the Northwest Mounted Police, who searched the area but found no trace of the villagers. And that was the end of the story as reported by Kelleher. But besides the legend, did anything ever become of LaBelle's chilling story. Joe LaBelle and Emmett E. Kelleher were indeed real people, but after closer investigation, it was found that their story had a few holes in it. After Kelleher published the story in a newspaper called The Danville Bee, news of the supposed incident spread through the community and the Northwest Mounted Police began receiving inquiries. However, after an investigation in January 1931, Sergeant J. Nelson filed an internal report that was later released to the public, stating that he could find no foundation for this story. During his investigation, he discovered that Joe LaBelle hadn't actually been trapping in the area long at all. According to Nelson, LaBelle had taken out his first trapping license that same season, meaning he wouldn't have been familiar with the Inuit village from previous visits, as he claimed in his story. After taking a closer look at the news story and investigating Kelleher, 
Sergeant Nelson found that the reporter's journalism wasn't as reputable as some had assumed. He concluded that Kelleher was more known for publishing colorful stories rather than factual reports. Besides this, it was found that one of the photos provided in the news story was actually from 1909, 22 years prior to the alleged incident. After these details came to light, most people forgot about the story until it was published in Stranger Than Science 30 years later. Through the years, the story of the vanished village has captivated the imagination of both the general public and other writers. Other authors later retold the story in essence, often changing the location or crucial details along the way. Pieces of the story can be found in works such as Whitley Strieber's Majestic, Dean Kuntz's Phantoms, and Stephen King's Storm of the Century. King's work also draws inspiration from another story of a disappeared community, one that was famously true. The missing colonists of Roanoke Island are likely the most well-known real-life example of an entire community disappearing. English settlers arrived on the island in 1587. By 1590, they were all gone and left almost no clues as to what happened. There were approximately 112 to 121 English settlers on Roanoke Island, which is now a part of North Carolina. The fate of this community is still largely unknown today, but historians and researchers have come up with a few hypotheses. Some believe that a virus wiped out the community. Others posit that a huge storm, such as a hurricane, decimated the area and killed its inhabitants. The settlers only left two clues behind, the word Croatoan carved into a gatepost and crow etched into a tree. This suggests that the colonists were, at the very least, planning to migrate to Croatoan Island, which is modern-day Hatteras Island, just south of Roanoke. But there's no definite answer on whether they ever reached their destination. Additional theories involve the indigenous communities who had lived on and around Roanoke generations before the English arrived to colonize the island. One theory suggests that the settlers were completely killed off by indigenous tribes. Other researchers suspect, based on archeological remains, that the colonists actually split up and merged with different indigenous communities after unsuccessfully living off the land by themselves. During the time that LaBelle's story was first published, Inuit communities in Canada, Alaska, and Greenland still lived independently and mostly separately from settler communities coming into contact primarily by fur trade. Oftentimes when colonists encounter indigenous communities, they regard them as exotic or mystical. It's possible that Joe LaBelle bought into these notions in his tale, as many settlers still thought of Inuit communities as mysterious in the early 1930s. In the story, LaBelle mentions an evil spirit called Tornrark, hinting that this entity could be responsible for the village's disappearance but according to the Curious Fortian blog, Tornrark is likely a misnomer for Torngarsuk, one of the many names given to a bear god in Inuit folklore, who is actually seen more as a benevolent deity. While spirituality and mythology is a large part of Inuit communities, their impeccable resourcefulness is an aspect of culture that is sometimes overlooked. These nomadic communities are able to survive off of natural resources, by fishing and hunting caribou and sea mammals like whales, walruses, and seals. Each part of the hunted animals were used efficiently for food, clothes, and tools. Inclusiveness, self-reliance, and collaboration were valuable traits, and everyone was expected to support each other in these communities. Fur trading with Europeans began back in the 18th century and lasted another 10 years or so after the legend of the vanished village was first published. By the 1940s, however, traders from settler communities seemed less willing to travel to Inuit regions, which were far away from most cities. Dwindling investment and attention to these communities eventually led to the end of trading, and the Canadian government began to forcibly settle Inuit communities, causing pressure for them to adapt Western lifestyles. After years of neo-colonialist policy, much of Canada's Inuit population live in small communities that are often impoverished. But in the late 1990s, 
After years of activism and negotiations, each Inuit region has successfully settled its constitutionally protected Aboriginal rights agreements, including titles to their own land in each of their four regional homelands. These regions include Inuvialuit, Nunavik, Nunatsiavit, and Nunavut, which became its own territory in 1999. They've also won back extended administrative powers to govern according to their own ways of life. Joe LaBelle's story was unsettling and hair-raising, but it was just that, a ghost story likely conjured up to fascinate and frighten Kelleher and his readers. Let us know in the comments if there are any other historical legends that could use further examination to see whether they're based on fact, fiction, or somewhere in between. Thanks again for watching Haunting History. Until we meet again.